Hi, my name is Tom Yankula from the University of Texas at Austin, and thank you for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about our work in building practical digital twins for clinical oncology. So what you're looking at right here is an axial cross section of an X-ray CT. You can make out the abdominal aorta here, the vertebral column, this is the liver, and there's these two conspicuous lesions, call them tumor one and tumor two here on the, on the, on the liver. And so what typically happens is when a patient's been diagnosed with a solid tumor malignancy, they come in and they get high resolution CT or MRI, and someone goes in and measures the longest dimension of um, a of target of what are called target lesions. And so these are two target lesions right here. And then they sum them up. And this one is about 3.8 centimeters at baseline. Patient goes on treatment, the patient comes back. You can see there's been very little change here, maybe a 5% increase in the measurement here. But then you come back for visit three and there's a 16% increase. Now you might think that this is a bad situation because it's progressive disease. Um, uh, what happens though is that the patient's changes are put into one of four bins. If the tumor has completely gone away, it's called a complete response. If it's um, uh, shrunk by 30% or more, it's called a, pro a partial response. If it's grown by 20% or more, then it's considered progressive disease. And if it's none of those, it's called stable disease. So this is visit three. And so it's still being called at this point, stable disease, because it hasn't crossed that 20% threshold. Come to visit four, now we've crossed this 20% threshold and it's a 32% increase. In visit five, then things are not looking so good at all. And there's about almost a 90% increase. So this is what's done in the standard of care setting, really even within the clinical trial setting. It's not really so much done in the standard of care setting. This, this was called RESIST criteria, the response evaluation criteria in solid tumors. And so the problem with this, of course, is that you're looking at morphological changes, which are temporally way downstream from the under, underlying cellular and molecular mechanisms. And the big problem with this is that there's a lot of time that has passed here. So four months have passed where you're still calling this disease stable disease. And by the time you can call it progressive disease by the resist criteria, then it's, um, uh, it's been six months. So that is way too late. Morphological changes are temporarily downstream from the underlying biological changes. We can't really wait until these underlying processes manifest themselves anatomically because it's too late. You wanna be able to identify very early in the course of therapy if a therapeutic regimen is working or not, because if it's not working, you wanna adjust the intervention. So we have to develop methods that can accurately predict the tumor dynamics early in the course of therapy. Not only would this let us predict the outcomes, but it also let us guide interventions so long as you can make those predictions early enough Emma, in disease progression so that you can try alternative interventions. Problem, of course, is without a guiding mathematical theory, we're left with trial and error and the risk of being overdramatic. That's what we have. We, we have this thing that we call the clinical trial system. This means we have to try things empirically, but the space to explore is enormous. There's way too many variables, way too much heterogeneity across patients to really explore every um, a part of the, of the parameter space that you want to do um, empirically. That is within the clinical trial framework. So you have to come up with a mathematical model. And so our approach is to build these what we call mechanism-based mathematical models to breathe life into digital twins to enable designing optimal treatment plans for the individual patient. And this mechanism-based modeling, this is a way of trying to, to um, point out that this is different than the big data artificial intelligence approach where you're trying to learn about the individual from a very large population. Our point of view is to calibrate these mathematical models by individual patient data, which is possible if your models are based on underlying mechanisms. So this is about how the next 17 or so minutes of your life are gonna go. I can tell you about this iSpy clinical trial. And if you've already are familiar with this, I certainly don't mean to insult you. I just, it's, a, it's, it's something we can learn from. And then from this suitable motivation, we'll move into physics and biology-based math modeling and then show how that can be used to build digital twins and potentially work towards N equals one clinical trial where the one is the individual patient, of course. All right, so iSpy, um, employs this adaptive clinical trial to increase trial efficiency by minimizing the number of participants and time required to evaluate a new therapy. So what typically happens is the iSpy, iSpy is this sort of forced acronym that I can never remember. But anyway, um, a, there might be 10 arms going on, 10 different experimental regimens and one standard of care regimen. And a patient comes in and presents with a series of characteristics. <clears throat> and based on those characteristics, they're put to one of these um, uh, trial arms. And um, uh, as, as the patient progresses through it, you can see what the response is. If the response is good, then the next time a patient with those sort of characteristics comes onto the iSpy trial, they will have a higher weighting to go to the arm that that patient just went on. So here's the picture. Right here, you've got your iSpy network. A new patient comes on. They're going to be placed onto an experimental or control arm. You, you look at the patient outcome, whether it's residual cancer burden or pathological complete response for these patients. This is a neoadjuvant therapy. So 
therapy before surgery. And if you go to surgery and there's no tumor left, it's called a pathological complete response. And that's what you want to get to because the five-year survival for patients that achieve a path CR in the new adjuvant setting is very, very high. So depending on what their outcome is, you update the predictive um, uh, probabilities of uh, how a patient with these characteristics uh, who performed well on that, that arm that they went on to, you update the predictive probabilities. And then after enough of this, you either see that the, the, that particular arm is working really well for a particular set of patients, and then you move it along into the clinical trial thing, potentially getting um, FDA approval. But if it's um, uh, not going well, then you terminate the um, uh, the, that, that trial arm. And then this update, you update the randomization probability. So for the next patient who comes in, um, uh, if that previous patient did well on a particular arm, then you would update the trial probabilities for that patient to go on to that arm and have a chance of a good outcome. So patient characteristics and outcomes are used to update how future patients are assigned to study arms. The adaptive design seeks to place patients on arms less likely, um, uh, to, to, uh, seeks to <laughs> This is exactly opposite. The adaptive design seeks to place patients on arms more likely to help them and do so as possible in the life of, as soon as possible in the life of the trial. So we seek to develop methods that accomplishes for the individual through prediction rather than the population, which is what's happening for the ice spy through assessing populations. And once again, I wanna emphasize that this has a, the word wrong. The adaptive design seeks to place patients on arms more likely to help them and do so as soon as possible in the life of the trial. All right, so iSPY seeks to assess early in therapy which population would benefit from a particular treatment. So our goal is to try to predict early in therapy which individual will benefit from a particular treatment response. So trying to move from assessing to predicting and from the population to the individual. Of course, it's not just about predicting response, the predictions have to be actionable. So you wanna be able to guide interventions. So our goal here is to build some mathematical models um, uh, that can incorporate patient-specific information to make patient-specific predictions. And the metaphor that we like to tell about a lot is that just as satellites provide data for weather forecasting, um, uh, you know, information on humidity or temperature gradients or pressure gradients, wind speed, all this stuff um, uh, populates some, um, uh, you know, variations of the Navier-Stokes equations, and you use that to provide um, a, a, a weather forecast. Here, we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to use imaging data to provide data for tumor forecasting. So just as you might have a global humidity map going into a weather model to make a weather forecast, we have um, measurements on you know, blood flow and cellularity going into a tumor model to make a tumor forecast. And this is a sort of a paradigm we put in place, good grief, seven years ago now in this perspective piece. All right, so here is a example of a mathematical model. If you're not used to looking at these, I, I hope I can walk you through it. The left-hand side says the rate of change of the number of cells N at position X and T with respect to time. The rate of change of those number of cells with respect to time is equal to three components, how they're moving around, how they're proliferating, and how they're responding to treatment right here. So this is a diffusion term if you're into that, one derivative in time, two derivatives in space, that's a diffusion term. Then we have our logistic growth growing up to a carry capacity theta, and then um, we have our, our, our treatment efficacy right here. And so now we have to take our, our imaging data to populate the parameters that are in here. So we use contrast enhanced MRI data to give us an estimate of how the drugs are being delivered. We use our diffusion weighted MRI data to tell us an estimate of um, a proliferation. And then we could also do things like segment the two tissue types um, uh, into, uh, if we're working in the breast, which is what this presentation is about, into fibroglandular tissue and adipose tissue and the tumor itself, and then assign different mechanical properties to those tissue types. And that's gonna describe how the tissue is moving around. So we might have a patient at scan one and scan two. So this is before therapy. This is early in the course of therapy, maybe one or two cycles into um, a therapy. And you take those two data sets um, uh, for your contrast enhanced and your diffusion weight data, and you calibrate this model to that data. And so what you end up with is a map of proliferation. The light blue indicates very low proliferation. This is mostly all adipose tissue. If you have um, a, a Darker blues right here, this indicates a little bit more proliferation and the yellow and red guys that are popping out are the highest proliferation rates. But we also have this estimate of drug distribution from our contrast enhanced MRI data. And so those two things go into our, this model and there's a few other equations associated with this interest, in the interest of time, they're not here. And so you have this predicted cell number right here. And you can see, we compare this to what happens at scan three. And so at some places we do a really good job. Um, uh, in some regions, you know, there's a low cellularity prediction here, low here. Um, uh, in some regions, there's a high predictive value. 
and we do pretty good there. And you can compare it and overall we do a pretty good job. There's some places like this guy right here, this little blue dollop right here, low cellularity. We don't seem to be catching that very well. But if we do this over a whole bunch of patients, you can see that we're actually doing really good on predicting the, um, uh, the measured cell count change as estimated by the diffusion MRI and predicted by that mathematical model on the previous slide. So here's one patient right here. The red is indicated what is observed at the end of therapy and the blue is what was predicted. And there's a pretty good overlap between these two. And so when you go over here and you look at these 139 patients that we did, there's a really good concordance correlation coefficient between these two for um, a measured and predicted cell counts. Similarly for measured and predicted volume changes. If you're not familiar with the CCC, it's like a Pearson cor correlation coefficient with a penalty for being off the line of unity. All right, and so the area under the curve for predicting who's gonna achieve that pathological complete response at the, end of, at the end of therapy and who will have residual disease is about 0.89 for the 50 patients we've run through the whole pipeline so far. There's still, you know, whatever this is, about 89 more patients to go through and, and we're currently working on that. So we feel like we're getting pretty good at predicting the spatial and temporal development of these tumors in the neoadjuvant setting, which is good because now if we have a model that can predict how these tumors are growing in space and time, with, a, with, a, with this fairly high degree of accuracy, then we can start trusting the model to then sort of guide on a patient-specific basis what the intervention should be. At least in theory, we can start to identify alternative therapeutic regimens that would be predicted to outperform the standard of care. So let's try to dig into that. So we're gonna, in order to do that, we have to build these digital twins based on that model and the patient-specific data to run a whole bunch of different simulations to see which, um, uh, which therapeutic regimen is the best one. So if you get nothing else out of this talk, I would encourage you to look up this paper by Karen Wilcox. She's the director of our Odin Institute for Computational Engineering and Science here at UT Austin. And this is a fantastic paper that um, uh, has a mathematical abstraction of digital twin and its associated physical uh, properties. She, so uh, Karen is an aeronautical engineer. So they use the, the language here of airplanes, but it, the, the, it can be carried over directly to um, oncology. And I'll try to make that connection for you. All right, so the blue stuff in box are the physical assets. These are the things you can actually touch and feel and intervene on. So there's the control inputs. These are the actions or decisions that influence the physical assets. So in how you, how you adjust the maneuver, how you maneuver the airplane um, or the drone, how you, how you decide when to perform maintenance or inspection decisions, where you want to put the sensors, that kind of thing. Then there's the physical state, like you know, skin thickness here on the on the um, uh, on the wing. If there's a crack, what are its uh, characteristics? Things you can actually go and touch and feel and measure. Then there's the observational data and things like measured strain or uh, the inspection data or even just flight logs. These are all the things that, in some sense, exist in the physical world. Then you have the digital manifestation of those things. There's the digital state. These are the parameters, the things that go into the model that define the computational models that's going to build your digital twin. There's the reward, you know, whatever mission success is, getting your Amazon pick, uh, package delivered to you, whatever, was there a minimum amount of fuel that was burned, um, uh, those kinds of things. And then there's the quantities of interest, things like the stress strain, displacement field on your wing, fail, failure stress, how long does the wing have before it needs to undergo a complete overhaul or whatever. So these are, um, uh, this is a really powerful framework to attack problems in oncology. And so, if we try to take those three physical asset boxes and our three digital asset boxes and try to convert that into, um, uh, into the parlance of, uh, of oncology, this is what we have. We have our physical state, call it S sub I. The I indicates that we're going to be iterating on this. So this is the I th the first time through it, for example. You have your anatomy and physiology, the mechanical and physiological state of the patient that actually exists in the patient. Then you have your observational data. We use a lot of imaging data, so you have stuff that can tell you about anatomy, blood perfusion, vessel permeability, cell density, metabolism, there's lots of things, hypoxia. Um, uh, then there's the control inputs, the things you can do to the system. You can order another MRI scan, you can order another biopsy, you can intervene. So these are the ways that you can uh, intervene into the system. Then there's the, the sort of the, the digital manifestations of these, your digital state, the domain, the finite element mesh, your boundary conditions, the parameters that you care about, the tumor dynamics, um, uh, your inputs are your treatment regimens. You, in this example right here, you could have three, this is indicating three different treatment regimens. One big bolus, three smaller boluses, and then a daily bolus, bolus over uh, 21 days. So this one would be a third of this one three times. This would be 21st of this one 21 times. A whole range of things you could explore in your digital state. Then there's your quantities of interest, how the therapy is distributing in and around the tumor, the tumor shape, 
a cell density throughout the tumor, and then there's your rewards. For us in oncology, these are things like treatment efficacy and toxicity. And so you can imagine exploring your outcomes as a function of dose and scheduling, and the, perhaps the optimal measurement is right here, where every point on this surface here is a different combination of therapies and interventions and timing and dosing and so forth. But once you have a mathematical model that can recapitulate how a tumor is growing and responding to therapy, this is the kind of thing you can do. And you can't do this, um, uh, you can't do this by trial and error. There's, there's too many parameters, too many patients would be required, it would take forever and a gazillion dollars. So the patient presents with the physical state, SMI, you make some observations on that, you then build your digital state to sort of um, uh, map out your quantities of interest and try to optimize these so that your rewards are optimized. And then you go around and you take another set of measurements perhaps, and it's this perhaps could it change if you're gonna take another biopsy, could perhaps also change on if you're gonna change your treatment and then it iterates around, loops back around to physical state um, uh, S2. And this goes around until the conclusion of therapy. I wanna drill down a little bit more on this one right here. Uh, we made some progress on this guy. So if we look, there's a lot going on here, so I'll try to guide you through this. So now we're looking at the change in drug concentration from a single dose that's over here. This is the outline of the breast, nipple would be here, chest walls over here. The tumor is inside this sort of dashed box right here. So this is one dose, concentration of the drug goes very high and then it wanes um, due to the pharmacokinetics of the drug. And so there's a very high concentration initially and then it washes out over time. And by the, you know, by a time a few days have passed, depending on the half-life of this drug, there's not a whole lot left. But if we can take the same total dose and distribute it differently, then we can see that the concentration in and around the tumor is maintained higher over the course of therapy. And this is due to the, you know, at the risk of, for lack of a better word, the pipes that are feeding this tumor and each person's tumor is differently. So each therapeutic regimen is gonna be, be optimized on the individual patient so that you bathe this tumor and drug for as long as possible. So if I pull out this drug here, segment out the drug and render it in 3D, this is the concentration. The color tells you the concentration. It's very high at first, and then it wanes, and this is the size of the tumor. Whereas if we have these multiple therapeutic options, or sorry, if we have, the, if we have this alternative therapeutic option where we give the same total dose, but a, a smaller amount each time, then the, 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 drug, the, the tumor is bathed in drug for a lot of, longer period of time, and you would hypothesize that this one down here um, uh, this one down here, this is the predicted response to a multi-dose. It's gonna end up with a, a further decrease in, um, uh, in tumor size over this 21 day regimen right here, a little bit more than 50% reduction. So we've kind of done a, a poor man's version of this in a, in a small number of patients, 11 patients, preliminary work. And what this is, is here is the percent change in the breast tumor size, and this is patient number over here. So the blue is what the standard regimen would give the patient. In fact, this is the change the patient actually had, that, that blue right there. And then the red is what, um, uh, is, or what we feel our best alternative regimen would be. So in some patients, there's absolutely no change at all between what they received and what we think our, their best regimen would be. In some patients, there's very little change. But in some patients, there's a very big change. So in this patient, they're going from stable to disease to partial response. Similar story here and here. Here we're going from progressive disease on what the patient actually responded to what we would hypothesize would be stable disease if they're given our alternative therapeutic regimen. And the key here thing is that the best alternative regimen for all these patients was different for all of the patients because they all have different vascular features, all have different morphological features. And so this is trying to get at the idea that you really need to do patient specific um, uh, therapy. But if you don't have a mathematical model under the hood describing how to do it, you're left with trial and error. Uh, just to summarize here, the differences in the reduction in tumor size between the standard and optimal alternative regimen ranges from 0% to about 50%, these guys. Um, uh, and on average, it's about an initial 21% reduction over that 21 day regimen. All right, so our summary here, we wanna get beyond just assessing response. It's not good enough, it takes too long. And by the time you're assessing response, um, the patient has already undergone weeks or months of therapy that haven't given them the best benefit possible. So we wanna get past assessing response and we wanna to get to predicting response. iSpy illustrates the power of adaptive trials by running many different trials at one time and updating the probability for a patient to go on a particular arm when a new patient presents based on the successes or failures of the previous patients who have already gone through the, the trial. But it's still only at the population level. We wanna be able to do this at the individual patient level. And we feel that the physics and biology-based modeling captures the spatial temporal dynamics of individual patients' tumors 
using their individual characteristics that we get by imaging or other ways. Our lab happens to do a lot of imaging. Um, uh, and so that you can populate these mechanism-based models with patient-specific data to make patient-specific predictions. So digital twins plus physics biology-based modeling provides a practical means to optimize patient outcomes. Once you have that spatial and temporal um, a model that can accurately recapitulate how the tumor is changing in space and time, then you start to have some faith in it or some trust in it, and you can go on the computer and try a bunch of different therapeutic regimens to find the one with the highest probability of maintaining tumor control for as long as possible. And I would emphasize that this is just not, it's not just computer games. We're trying to get past this um, uh, idea of looking at changes at the population level to look at the changes at the individual level, because that's the whole problem with cancer, right? The heterogeneity is so great. It's not just one disease, right? It's somewhere north of hundred, depending on how you carve it up. So a woman doesn't just have cancer. She just doesn't have breast cancer. She may not even have just triple negative breast cancer. She has one of the five or six subtypes that are currently identified. And the drugs are getting more and more targeted to try to capture the heterogeneity of the individual patient. So our models have to capture that individual heterogeneity. And I just don't see how that can be done with using only an artificial intelligence, big data approach. I feel like we really have to use these physics and biology-based models that can, that can rigorously and directly capture patient-specific information from their therapeutic regimen here to how it's being delivered, to their proliferation rates, um, uh, to how the tissue mechanical properties are, are causing the, are preventing the tumors to grow in one, how, preventing the tumor cells to migrate in one direction versus another. Of course, these are all the people who do the work, highlighted work from David Horman with Ernesto Limo and Cheng Yuo Wu. I, of course, just sit in the corner and worry about budgets, but I thank you very much for your time and thank you very much to the patients who participate in our studies. You know, back in the day when I was actually at the MR scanner collecting all this data, I would always ask people, why were they um, participating in these research studies? And they all always said that they wanted healthcare to be better for their children and grandchildren. And it's very sobering to hear that. So we always try to thank our patients who participate in our studies. So thank you very much for your time and attention. And I hope you're having, you and yours are having a happy and healthy day. Bye.